this was a subject that was interesting to me because Alexander Wilson is the only known friend of Meriwether Lewis to visit his burial place in, you know, outside of what is now Honewald, Tennessee. He goes there in 1810, and they have quite a relationship. And there's, as a contemporary noted, they were very similar in personality and even a bit in appearance. And I think Alexander Wilson's life, as brief as it was, kind of offers for Lewis's post-expedition life, almost an alternate reality. The birds of a feather, the friendship of Mary with Lewis and Alexander Wilson and their contributions to ornithology. So it's not clear when exactly they met, but it seems likely they potentially met and became friends before the expedition. We know for sure their friends and correspondence by the year 1807 looks a lot like it's before, potentially when Lewis is Jefferson's private secretary and interacting with a lot of mutual friends and scientific colleagues in Philadelphia and throughout the early U.S. scientific intellectual community. And a colleague's daughter later considered both men similar in personality, temperament, even somewhat in physical appearance. So on the left, you have an, a portrait of Mr. Wilson that would be published in some of the earlier versions, earlier editions of his publication, American Ornithology. And of course, to the right, the St. Memon painting of Lewis done from life shortly after the expedition. And mm -hmm. I view Alexander Wilson as an everyman Renaissance man. Mm -hmm. He's born July 6th, 1766 in Paisley, Scotland, to a mm -hmm. kind of working class family in an era where for watch. Work, working class Scots, and they're only there's a lot of transition. Yep, they were. So he be. He starts out as a young boy. He gets to go to school until when he's about between 10 and 12, his mother dies. He was a big advocate for his education. On top of that, his father remarries. And so he quickly has some very young step siblings, eventually half siblings on top of the siblings he already has. And he needs to go to work. So it's kind of, it's not unlike how Mary with a Lewis, the moment, you know, very much his, Ed, formal education ends very early, especially once his stepfather dies. Very common for that time period for children to essentially be expected to become adults the moment a tragedy happens. So he leaves his education, but still tries to read and play musical instruments when he can. And he starts out, he apprentices to become a weaver, which in this era, that's, it's more, it's kind of a craftsman's position. It takes a lot of technical skill and knowledge, but he remains interested in poetry, art, and nature, and he's kind of a contemporary of Robert Burns, even have some literary interaction together. And this is an interesting era, because think of for Scotland, one of the things that's happening with industrial industrialization, you have the highland clearances, where people are being evicted from the highlands to make way for larger flocks of larger breeds of sheep to then produce wool to get sent to mills down in those industrializing you know basically the bigger cities in scotland as well as in england and we're not at the same level as you'll see by the victorian era but the human working conditions are changing and in wilson's time he's seeing the just appalling conditions for working people whether it's weavers like him or people who have lower skills and how they're going from being people who in former times would have worked from their home and had some sense of value and adequate payment somewhat to being a number treated horribly, paid unfairly in inhumane working conditions. So he starts writing poetry that gets him that calling, you know, it's calling out factory owners and getting into, him into trouble. He's in many of his writings, essentially calling for what today we call unionization. Now think about, what's going on in the 1780s, 1790s in Europe, you have revolution in France. And for many in the English upper class and kind of managerial class, you have the, they're on that position where there's a threat. They don't want to spark revolution, but they also don't want to make martyrs. So ultimately, after some lawsuits and other things, he decides he's done with Britain. He's done with this place. He emigrates to the United States in 1794 with one of his nephews. 
and initially begins life as a teacher in Philadelphia. He also will teach in New Jersey, then go back to Pennsylvania. And I consider him an every man's renaissance man because you think of people like Thomas Jefferson, a renaissance man who is highly educated, has a lot of skills. And because of that, he he, he, he does he dabbles in all kinds of different fields. And because he's from a better off background, Jefferson, men like Jefferson have the time to do that. In the case of men like Wilson, because they happen to be at least educated enough and able to you know, become more educated, but they're not from that more elite background, someone like Wilson has to be able to do as much as possible because there, there is no other alternative. And then as now, teachers in the United States not exactly making a great penny. He'd probably have a lot to say about life for teachers, their working conditions, and their pay today. So he talks about learning, surveying, improving his mathematical skills. And children who had him as a teacher mentioned that he was very enthusiastic. He liked to kind of go above and beyond and use creative methods for teaching. And that if kids got good grades on their papers, he would draw pictures of birds and little animals for them. And they thought that was awesome. He's not exactly happy with teaching. He's teaching pretty much all the subjects they can, even music. He wants to branch more out into ornithology and science. And one of his neighbors and mentors was William Bartram, who himself had a long career throughout the early United States, basically going throughout the Southeast, researching birds and insects and all that, and plants. So William Bartram, he encourages him to pursue ornithology and art, improve his sketching skills, to document birds for science and for a growing reading public in the United States as well as in Western Europe. George Ord is another patron and friend who would also help Wilson uh, finance his pro project. And there's a lot of people who are who intersect with Lewis's world in this same era, like, like Benjamin Smith Barton. So when Wilson writes back to family and friends back in Scotland, he tells them, I have had many pursuits since I left Scotland music, drawing, and et cetera, and et cetera. I am now about to make a collection of our finest birds. So when his range expanded and he grows in reputation, he'll hire other artists to color his illustrations. Many of them are former students of him, boys and girls. That's kind and of one of the things he quickly yeah. realizes is that a lot of yeah. the amateur or artists in training yeah. that he like some of his former students better followed his directions what? and descriptions than more experienced painters and colorists. Yeah. Because oftentimes some of the people who were more trained and professionalized would decide, oh, I'd rather have the bird be this color. And Wilson, knowing he saw it with his own eyes, that's the wrong color. He preferred to take things into his own hand and keep the coloring work to himself and the students he had trained. One of Wilson's poems that he writes in the West gives a good example of how he is still very much an Enlightenment era man, but he's also on that cusp of Romanticism. And he's writing about the ways, especially in the United States, he's able to experience nature as more than just a bland physical world, that there's emotion and joy attached to it. So one of his big epic poems that he publishes in 1804 in the United States is called The Foresters. It's somewhat built off of his experiences traveling and doing research in the kind of upstate New York. And for example, a section from that, far spreading forests from its shores ascend. Now towering headlands over the flood impend. These deep below in softened tints are seen where nature smiles upon herself serene. Oh, lovely scenes and ecstasy I cry that sink to nothing all the work of pride. And this is one of the ones where he sticks to English. Many of his writings were done also in Scots. He, that was probably his home language growing up, not straight English. And when you read some of his work in Scots or the mix of Scots and English, it's a little rough to read. Now, Wilson, to me, this isn't surprising given his thoughts on inhumane working conditions in Britain. He was absolutely abhorred everything about slavery. And even though some of his contemporaries and friends are, you know, do own enslaved people and benefit from slavery, 
Wilson being in Philadelphia otherwise was mostly surrounded by people who were committed to anti-slavery abolitionist causes. And many of those are people who Lewis was mutually friends with. Benjamin Rush, a lot of people, very vocal. And for Wilson, a lot of his travels brought him face to face with the realities of slavery. And bear in mind in this era, even though it's mostly being contained to the South by this point, there are people who own enslaved people in the North. And his letters from his travels to friends and eventually a love interest reflect his feelings. And he noted that he often talked to enslaved African Americans for information on the local bird species, knowing that they were often the ones spending the most time outside in a given place. And for him, it was helpful because he was often there at times a year where he didn't know what the same bird might be doing other seasons if it remained in that area. And he noted that much of his information came from African American women, that some of them were more comfortable talking to him. And in one scene he sees in 1810, while he's between Lexington, Kentucky and Nashville, he comes across an auction. He noted that the fact that horses were being auctioned off right next to women being separated from their children and how he goes, as you know, as the quote I show says, he writes, damn, damn slavery, this one infernal custom which the Virginians have brought into this country, rude and barbarous appearance of the crowd. So much of his writing by his own era standards in the U.S. was quite radical. And he would write to friends back in Philadelphia about how he would often hear slave owners in the South say, oh, such and such people who are a part of my staff are lazy. Or Wilson would notice how exhausted the enslaved were. And he'd notice for himself acts of what Wilson recognized as resistance by not doing all of the chores or breaking tools. And Wilson recognized that as exactly what he called for in the factories in Scotland. So Wilson offers some very surprising, very very straightforward views on slavery for someone of his era. And it troubles him because many of the people he is friends with see nothing wrong with this. Another collaborator he has is an Irish artist named John James Farrellett. You might recognize. He is the man whom Lewis will hire to paint Great Falls based on what were likely Lewis's own sketches, which are now gone if they even existed. And it never appears in the Biddle publication in the U.S., but it does appear in an 1817 publication in Dublin. And there's a good chance that Wilson introduced Lewis to Barlett because that was often his go-to guy for doing the engraving. So Lewis is an ornithologist. Here he is. So we know that he's trained by a lot of the same intellectual community members that Wilson is hanging out with, and we know that among the individuals training him for bird taxidermy is Dr. Benjamin Smith Barton, 1802-1803, and Lewis's naming of birds on the expedition follows a combination of folk or vernacular names along with scientific Linnaean convention, and Clark is doing the same thing. And I'm not going to list every single bird Lewis talks about or else we would be here forever, just like I can't talk about every single thing Wilson does or else we'd be here forever. But September 17th, 1804, Lewis describes what he calls the Corvus. That's a black-billed magpie, which they will capture four of, and that will, some interesting tidbits that Wilson gleans from that, I'll mention a little bit. So Lewis, he's pretty good at transcribing bird calls, and I would say he's pretty spot on in many of these. He has good ear. So, it's classic. Twait, 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 twait. And I'm not going to put in the squawkiness in my voice, but you get the idea. Sometime in late September or early October 1804, somewhere in the Dakotas, they capture four live magpies. So I will play this. Hopefully it will work. So black field magpies, you can find them in still is across the Great Plains and parts of Montana, a lot of Idaho. There's mm -hmm. certain species encountered by Lewis and Clark are you can no longer find in their habitat. Black-billed magpies are doing pretty good. Even when 
European settlers show up and you get grain elevators and stuff. Black-billed magpies love that stuff. So magpies have fared pretty well. And Wilson draws a pic, and I say drawing a picture that sounds, that really understates what he does. That magpie picture to the left is one that I took at Missouri Headwaters State Park. Now, two years ago, Three Forks, Montana. They That one, if you look close enough, it's hopping around with the grasshopper. They will eat all kinds of things. They love shiny things too. And in Michael Haynes' painting, uh, Chicago Leo's First Gift, the exhibition constructing Fort Mandan, in November through December 1804. If you look to the left, Haynes has depicted Lewis with at least one magpie in a cage. And of course, the Kaguya showing up with a bison hide and Toussaint Charbonneau and the dog, everybody. And at some point during the time, they will also collect a live shark-tailed grouse. And of course, a black-tailed prairie dog. And in spring 1805, April 7th, when the main party goes upriver, two pirogues and six dugout canoes. The barge, or as you may know, the keelboat goes downriver with some return group guys and some specimens for Jefferson, which include the four magpies, the sharp tailed grouse, and the curry dog. Interestingly, when they get to, when the shipment ultimately gets to New Orleans and then send it around the Gulf of Florida to the Chesapeake, they note that the prairie dog isn't doing great. But the birds seem fine. Ultimately, only the prairie dog and one of the magpies will survive. So something about that sea air. On October 16th, 1804, Lewis also described the common poor will, which I sometimes describe as a blob bird, because they just have like a blob. And he gets information from the Arikara Nation, who in this era they're living in kind of the northern part of what's now South Dakota. And he combines that with his own observations and experimentation, and he notes that the, as he calls them, the Rickeries, call this bird Tona. Its note is Atotona. I can, I can only read his transcriptions and give an accurate call so much. But he notes it's a nocturnal bird, sings only in the night, as does the whippoorwill, so he recognizes a relation. So I'll play sound of them. And if you aren't able to hear that, you can definitely Google me or look them up on YouTube. Now, Lewis is a, sci is a citizen amateur scientist of his time, which means a lot more stabbing and live dissection or vivisection of living things than any of us would care for today. So he writes in his description that after he runs, you know, he's noticed that they're in a dormant state. It's the beginning of, it's basically fall in the Great Plains. And you know that it wasn't moving a lot. So he says he ran his pen knife into its body under the wing and completely destroyed its lungs and heart, yet it lived upwards of two hours. This, I love how he spelled it, phenomenon I could not account for unless it proceeded from the law of circulation of blood. So they definitely have their own ways of adapting to when it gets very cold in this part of the continent, but also I'm not exactly a fan of stabbing birds, but... Once again, they're people, they're time period, and that was science at the time. They don't know. They don't know. They're going to learn. Later in the journey, of course, they're also going to encounter California condors on the lower Columbia, or as they refer to them as, the beautiful buzzard of the Columbia. It figures in a lot of cultural traditions for indigenous peoples along the lower Columbia and along the Pacific coast. In certain versions of the Clatsop Nation's creation story with Thunderbird laying eggs. Thunderbird is a California condor. And Lewis and Clark shoot and kill a lot of these. To be fair to them, they don't know that they're going to be endangered in the, by the 1980s. And, no, and you know, by, by the 1980s when the last ones were captured alive in California, they weren't even up that far north anymore. I do enjoy that Lewis, when describing these birds, he talks, he is, his, I'm paraphrasing, he essentially says, they're quite attractive birds when viewed from afar. These are birds with about a 10 to sometimes 12 foot wingspan. These are large birds. I've seen them at the zoo in Portland, the Oregon Zoo. You do not, people today do not have a frame of reference for seeing one of these until you see one. But yeah, when you see them up close, it has a face that only a condor mother could love. 
So when they're at Fort Clatsop, the captains are doing a lot of field notes for the past year of travel, and Lewis categorizes a lot of the birds by the regions they are found in. And it's interesting because Lewis, he barely writes, he almost doesn't write when they're at Fort Mandan, or if he did, we don't have that. And Fort Clatsop, he's pretty quiet until just into the new year, 1806, and then he's just writing away. So you reflect on the Stellar's J. And he calls it the blue crested, large blue crested corvus of the Columbia. And he compares it to the Eastern Blue Jay. And that's a very good comparison because they're Jays. And even with this, with the Stellar's J, you see a lot more black on it. But those feathers on its wings look so similar, you know, even the patterning to ones on your Eastern Blue Jay. And he describes their call, and he doesn't realize what 100% this bird has already been described by the German naturalist George Wilhelm Steller, 1741, hence the name. Sees it in Alaska following the wreck of Vitus Bering's ship, so Steller had quite the experience of his own. And that Stellar's Jay that I have here, I took that picture at Lolo Pass. That's going back almost nine years. Not too far away from where Lewis and Clark first saw one during the mountain crossing. And then that's also my eastern blue jay in Nebraska. So he's very good at recognizing birds being members of families but different species. And these two birds sound very similar. So Wilson, using Lewis's information, will draw that. And paint it. Yeah, skip in. And yeah, like any corvid, they're squawky and obnoxious and they'll fight other birds and steal stuff and like shiny things. It's what you gotta do when you're a corvid. So when Lewis gets back, him and Wilson will exchange a lot of information. Perfect timing because in 1807, Wilson begins promoting his upcoming very ambitious work, American Ornithology. And viewing Lewis's specimens and probably some of his notes helps influence that. And Wilson announces it in the prospectus as, to the lovers of natural history, a new and superb work, being the first of the kind ever published in America. So it's a pretty big deal. And ultimately the finished product would, according to its introduction, Include information of birds describing their size, plumage, places of resort, general habits, peculiarities, food mode, construction of their nests, incubation, migration, and they would receive it in volumes as they were published, which is pretty common to the publishing world of that era. And it's great because that shows that Enlightenment era drive for categorizing knowledge. And also it's very familiar for those of us who have any, you know, birding books or anything like that relating to wildlife where it's not, not just, look, a bird, I saw it somewhere, but trying to get that full picture. How do they build their nest? How is it different from another bird? What do they do in different seasons? Do they change their color? And Wilson puts in a little detail that reflects how he views natural history as an Enlightenment era view, but also part of a religious world. That it's a thousand new subjects for wonder and delight present themselves to our view, which before were entirely unseen or overlooked, in each of which we behold fresh evidences of a great, a good, and all upholding creator. Which reflects Wilson, he very much, he's an enlightenment man, still somewhat religious, but he views the pursuit of science as opening up God or the creator's mysteries rather than proving the lack thereof of a creator. And Thomas Jefferson, he's one of Wilson's first subscribers, and he's satisfied that it will give us valuable new matter as well as correct the errors of what we possessed before. So for Jefferson, he, he thinks it's great that there's Americans actually taking care of American science versus thinking of when Jefferson is, you know, if you're familiar with the story of when he's ambassador over in France and many of the French members of the court have a difficult time believing Jefferson saying that we have large animals here because they just assume everything in North America is smaller. So for Jefferson, 
he knows this is what is needed. Plus, as he sees it, it should probably help Lewis's book endeavors, or at least he hoped. So the first volume is published in 1807, and ultimately it will be nine volumes, with the last published in 1814 posthumously. And it would be reprinted many times with revisions, as more was learned. So Lewis collaborates with Wilson, Wilson collaborates with Lewis, and Lewis gets Wilson in contact with Sergeant John Ordway. And that's very useful for black Blackfield Magpie behaviors. So Ordway, you know, he's, he had been the expedition's first sergeant their 30 command, and he's the only man to leave a journal entry for every day of the trip, even if this thing was like nothing of notice happened today. And Lewis had purchased his journal to be used for the planned book. And one of the great details that Ordway leaves, like for me, this was very game changing in my view of how they get these magpies, because I never see it in any books on the expedition. But the way Ordway puts it, the, the the magpies had a tendency to go dashing into their very tents and carrying meat from the dishes. And Ordway had told Wilson, as you see in this quote, that whenever he'd go hunting, these birds were his constant companions. And the fact that he that Ordway told Wilson that magpies would come flying into their tents and you know, take meat off their plates, even though Ordway never told him straight up. Yeah, we caught one in a tent. It gives, you know, it would not be surprising if they quickly figured out, oh, we have a plate full of meat in the tent. Grab them. So Lewis and Wilson, during the short period that Lewis is back on the east before he goes back to St. Louis as governor of the upper Louisiana territory, Wilson is one of the men who he's collaborating with and how just, you know, going out enjoying time with. And Alexander Lawson, who's one of their ornithology friends and contemporaries, his young daughter at the time, Malvina Lawson, which is Smith, remembered all these people. And I love it because in later recollections, you remember that George Ord didn't like kids and wasn't very nice to her. Whereas she said Wilson and a lot of the other friends were always kind to her and approachable, and she was always a curious child asking about things. And she remembers Wilson, and I won't read the whole description, but that he was always very cheerful, and it was kind of amazing that he was even sometimes still alive because of all the things he'd do to go get bird specimens and see them. And she also, and she remembered that Wilson and Lewis were very similar in personality and temperament, that they were quiet and very polite, super, very observant. They listened more than they talked, but would become very animated and enthusiastic when you discuss anything of their favorite interests, especially birds and nature. So they also vaguely resembled one another, which in the, I think in these two portraits, you can see it. And I think it's interesting because she also gives a comparison also to Clark. Malvina noted that Lewis himself was rather small and dark in strong contrast to Clark, his companion, and added that she remembered that, he, that she would hear of her father speak of him as being one of the most proud and sensitive of human beings, and that the neglect of the government to ratify the arrangements he had made in good faith seemed to madden him, and that ending part referring to the return of Shehek Sho, the Mandan leader, from his home. During all this, Wilson has become he has a lady friend it's the sister of his friend daniel miller sarah miller she's about 27 years old at the time she is fashionable and intellectual she enjoys literature has a love for gothic horror and they have shared interests and opinions on science the arts books and social issues like slavery she is anti-slavery and wilson often is worried about how he could financially support her should they be married and when he's setting out on his trip to Tennessee later, he will write, My dear friend, 900 miles distant from you, sits Wilson, the hunter of birds' nests and sparrows, just preparing to enter on a wilderness of 780 miles, most of it the territory of Indians alone, but in good spirits, 
and expecting to have every pocket crammed with skins of new and extraordinary birds before he reached the city of New Orleans. And then notes to her, to have forgot my friends in the midst of strangers and to have forgot you of all others would have been impossible. So the two of them exchange a lot of letters. And throughout his lifetime, he does a lot of journeys in different parts of the East, researching birds, which means shooting and killing specimens to be taxidermy, but also trying to catch live specimens so you can observe them. One of my favorites, he captures an ivory-billed woodpecker, which, as we know, goes extinct in the 1940s, in part because Sanger, Sanger Sewing Machine Company builds a factory over one of the last habitats of theirs in Louisiana. But in early 1809, when he's in North Carolina, he captured an ivory-billed woodpecker, which, bear in mind, these are huge, and he talked about trying to keep it in a hotel and how when he brings it in under his coat, he mentions that it screams like a child and people at first look at him like he's kidnapping a kid, you know, then is now not a good look. And until they see it's a bird and they're like, okay, you know, apparently no one stopped him from bringing a giant woodpecker into his hotel room. But he mentioned that overnight, it nearly pecked its way through the wall. It had bored holes in the wall of his hotel room. He did not write in a letter, I believe it was to William Bartram, whether or not he had to pay a special fine to the hotel. Now, this is where he comes st more strongly into the Lewis and Clark world. He had been hoping to meet up with Lewis in St. Louis in 1810 or thereabouts, do some fun bird stuff, potentially go up to Missouri, at least Wilson going up to Missouri. Well, Lewis's death on October 11, 1809 changed that plan. So Wilson decided to change his trip west a little bit. He would examine some of the birds in the southeast, kind of head towards New Orleans, and incorporate a trip, a visit to Lewis's final resting place. So he sets out in early spring 1810. Initially, when he's on the Ohio River, he mentions he gets a small boat with a sail. He uses his oars a little bit to paddle down the Ohio. He mentions that on the back of this boat, on the he has painted, he names it the Ornithologist, which I love. Once he's about to Louisville and doesn't need it anymore, he mentions that he sells it to a gentleman who, looking at him, goes, what tribe of Indians are ornithologists? So he's somewhat, he makes it very clear in his letters to Sarah and other friends of, yeah, there aren't a lot of people like me in this, cor in this corner of the world. But not entirely. Because on March 19th, 1810, he meets John James Audubon. And at this time, Audubon, who is an emigre from France, he is working in a good store. And he's chatting with Wilson. And Wilson is asking if he'd like to subscribe to his book. And Audubon almost does. Until Audubon's business partner, Ferdinand, Ferdinand Rosier, he suggests to him in French, you should hold off for financial reasons. You can draw birds better than this guy. And... Audubon politely declines, and he, you know, him and Wilson, he talk because he tells him, yeah, I draw birds too, and Wilson tells him, these are very good, you should publish these if you get the chance. But Audubon mentions that when he's told in French, don't do it, your book, your birds are better anyways, he mentions that Wilson l gives him a look that looks offended and Audubon wonders, does he catch the tone of her voices or does he know French? There's nothing that says one way or another, my research, whether or not Wilson knew French or not, either it wouldn't surprise me. I also wouldn't be surprised if the man picked up on the tone of their dissing my work. So it, be, it kind of begins this very weird rivalry. The, the, Audubon and Wilson go looking at birds and shooting birds later that day or the next day, and they get into an argument over the identification of some crane flying by, which is a classic bird thing, which kind of sets Audubon on, on his road of, I'm going to be better than Wilson. So that's Audubon. Wilson also has a different traveling companion. In early 1810, he'd been shooting Carolina parakeets, another bird now extinct. He's shooting them for specimens, because that's what you do to get your subject to paint in this era. 
but he saves a bird who he had only wounded and he named her Paul. So she quickly became his pet and he brings her on the journey down the Natchez trace. And within a short amount of time, Wilson wrote that she knew her name, followed certain commands. He ate food out. Of, she ate food out of his mouth. And he had noticed that between looking at specimens of the Carolina parakeets he'd killed and watching her, that they would be either predominantly right footed or left footed like a human. And for those of you who might be think, oh, Lewis and Clark connection. Yeah, Lewis and Clark observed these flying by them when they're in present day Kansas City in 1804. Clark calls them parrot queets. And Paul is kind of a good traveling companion as a diplomat. When Wilson is staying with Choctaw and Chickasaw families along the way, oftentimes there isn't even great translation, he notices that Paul, the little bird, is a good beacon of goodwill, and the children loved her, and that people would laugh when he made her do tricks, and that when he contracts dysentery and he's super sick, his hosts went out of their way to care for him, but he had a feeling it's because they liked his bird. And he noted that they said that in their language, they pointed at her and said, Kalinky. But once they, he said, Paul, they would also go point at her and go, Paul. So he's going to find what ha about more about what happened to Lewis. He has a parakeet with him, Paul. And he enters what he calls a dark and gloomy wilderness. And he is the only documented friend of Lewis's to visit his burial site near Brenderstand. And... When he interacts with Priscilla Grinder, it's interesting because he is the first to get the story straight from her. Now, obviously, over time, her story will change for whatever reason, good or bad. And there's debate over whether they spelled their last name Grinder or Grinder. Wilson is the first to really put Priscilla and Robert Grinder's name out there for posterity. So... We get Grinder because of him, whether it's right or wrong or just one of many different family spelling. But he gets there, he hears a story, her story is one of suicide, and ultimately he will walk away saying, yeah, he probably took his own life, but he still has a lot of questions going, hmm, I'm not, I don't know for sure. But he does write a poem for Lewis, and he writes, for a reason perished in the storm, and desperation triumphed here. For hence be each accusing thought with him my kindred tears shall flow hail pity consecrate the spot where poor lost lewis now lies low lone as these solitudes appear wide as this wilderness is spread affection steps shall linger here to breathe her sorrows o'er the dead and he notices that he lies close by the common path with a few loose rails thrown over his grave unfortunately for that era especially when you know i know there's different especially now, different thoughts of whether Lewis took his own life or was murdered and all the specifics of both. But for the time, the official report was suicide, and although many of Lewis's friends still maintain their respect for him, for that era, that's a huge stigma, so it's not surprising that for that era, he was essentially buried on the side of the road, that despite everything he had done before, that stigma of suicide for many of that time period, even for some people today, that erases everything you've accomplished. So Grinder noted that he, so Wilson noted that he gave Robert Grinder money to put a fence around it and shelter it from hogs and wolves and all the other animals. And he gave Wilson his written promise that he would do it. And that Wilson left that place, he leaves there, going south down the trace, in a very melancholy mood, which was not much allayed by the prospect of the gloomy and savage wilderness, which I was just entering alone. And that is Metal Ford. If you're doing Lewis's last journey, that's his last river to cross. If you're Wilson, that's the next one you go over. And the sign there doesn't look too hot. That's how I saw it in on October 11th of last year. And Wilson will experience more adventures and run in. He run has a run in with someone who may or may not have killed someone. Wilson just has all these wild adventures. He gets on the ship in New Orleans. He's going to go to New York. And Paul meets an unfortunate end. Sadly, Wilson, he walks out of his cabin for a little bit. And this is a bird who had often climbed on his shoulders, come to her name, all this stuff. And 
one day when he's outside his cabin, she figure out how to get outside of her cage. And I say out of his cabin, but he's asleep. So he wants to give his presentation, but he's asleep. And yeah, Paul finds a way to get out of her cage. She doesn't know that that's not her own good because she gets out and the wind, you know, they're in the, they're in the Gulf of Mexico and the wind is too much for her. That's not where she's supposed to be flying. And she goes overboard and perishes in the Gulf of Mexico. So poor Paul, the Carolina parakeet. So Wilson's going to try to work with some of the expedition specimens, but he had a difficult time getting access. Much, much of the plant, animal, specimens, the notes, everything is a mess after Lewis's death. They've always been with different people, and to much of the scientists' frustrations, Jefferson wants it, wanted Lewis to do a book, but then sent him far beyond where the scientists were. So Wilson has a difficult time just even finding who has what. Ultimately, he will get to work with the Lewis's woodpecker, and that's he will name that bird after Lewis. And he, as given in the quote right, right there, he noted that that brave soldier, that amiable and excellent man, over whose solitary grave in the wilderness I have since shed tears of affliction, having been cut off in the prime of his life, I hope I shall not be, I hope I shall be pardoned for consecrating this humble note to his memory, until a more able pen shall do better justice to the subject. Now, Lewis's woodpeckers are interesting. I don't know if any of you saw it last year's PBS nature episode on woodpeckers. Lewis's woodpeckers rarely bore into wood. They fly catch. And, and while they do make noise, they aren't, they don't make a lot. So, play this. REI thinks we should buy stuff from them. So you might. Says so you could tell just a lot of squeaks. Lewis's woodpeckers do squeak. And my thought on them is if you think of the painting done by Michael Haynes around the bicentennial of Lewis in his captain's uniform, that's what these look like. And I love, one of the things I'd love to go back in time and pick Wilson's brain about is that what you were doing here? I have, I have only seen one of these in the wild once. 2016, it flew into my windshield near Wisdom, Montana and died. So, kind of sad. And that's the specimen that he, that Lewis had brought back. That bird has probably seen better days. And it had been given to Charles Wilson Peel after the exhibition. Wilson was able to look at it. And Wilson, pretty much all these scientists who were trying to look at this stuff, we're complaining about lack of access when different people had different things and how people who had gotten access to them before them had not left very good citations about their work. He, Wilson also names the Clark's Nutcracker, initially Clark's Crow, another Corvid. These are chatty and kind of like Clark, they are geographically savvy they can leave thousands of deposits of pine nuts and other food over thousands of miles and remember where all, all them are. They are much, much chattier. And of course, this video is not as chatty, but they're very chatty. Take my word on it or Google them. And I saw these ones I saw when I lived in Colorado for graduate school. These are living in Rocky Mountain National Park. So very, both interesting that the captain's two honorific birds, very common in the Rockies. Also the Western Tanager, another Rocky Mountain bird. He's, Lewis saw it in June 1806 in Idaho while they're waiting with the Nez Perce to be able to get back over the mountains. Very vibrant bird. Let's see if this one can do a quick squawk for us. Yeah, so very cool. And then, of course, here he will put those to paper, not in the written form, but art. And one of the big tragedies of how the journals end up being published initially as the two-volume edition with Nicholas Biddle in 1814 is that Biddle will 
omit most of the scientific content that Lewis had intended because he didn't feel suited to the task. And Clark felt both unsuited to the giant task, even though he was heavily involved, but also he was busy with other things. So instead, that first published narrative is more like an adventure story with a little bit of science sprinkled in. So Wilson's work for including Lewis's specimens in American ornithology is kind of one of the strongest ways that Lewis was at least known somewhat as a scientist after the expedition. Otherwise, a lot of the, his and Clark's findings, they did not get credit for. So Wilson ultimately, be, he becomes known as the, Ameri the father of American ornithology. In total, there will be nine volumes of American ornithology. They're illust and they'll illustrate and describe 286 species. 26 of them those were previously unknown to Western science law, those including Lewis Clark's birds. And Audubon, they'll have a rivalry with each other. Audubon hails from a well-off French emigrate family. He looked down on Wilson's lower class roots and self-made success. And like the description there, he laughs at how he thought of Wilson as this funny looking guy with a bird nose, sloppily dressed, chasing birds, looking too excited, which he would hate to see a lot of birders today because heck, when we go and look at birds, that's what we do. So we look like and he always got never got over how him and wilson disagreed on identifying cranes in 1810 and as for wilson he didn't have a lot of to say about audubon he didn't he didn't really try to let that bother him but he did know that he thought that audubon was just someone who liked to shoot birds who happened to draw pictures that he wasn't a scientist and he had left louisville saying Science or liter literature has not one friend in this place, which totally offended Audubon. But over time, Audubon would acknowledge Wilson as this, the American ornithologist, and his views would soften over the years when he realized how much of Wilson's work he had to depend on to become who he was. But Wilson, like Lewis, he doesn't live long. Only just less than four years after Lewis, Wilson dies August 23rd, 1813, at age 47. The cause was reportedly dysentery, overwork, and chronic poverty. And he was buried at Old Swedes, now Gloria Day Church Cemetery in Philadelphia. He leaves behind a lot of friends, some fam family who have emigrated to the United States. And he also leaves behind Sarah Miller. And according to some of the, some friends they had, they were engaged. I've done some research on that. It's difficult to determine one way or another, but he never married her. He never married. He really wanted to. George Ord paid to posthumously publish the remaining volumes of Wilson's work and Charles Lucien Bonaparte, who also sponsored future reprints. So his legacy, he's a predecessor to Audubon, and as much as Audubon would have hated to admit it, he's kind of the first true American ornithologist, as we would call it. And if Lewis had lived past 1809, the two may have shared that distinction. Lewis probably would have gotten in great arguments with John James Audubon, who also had somewhat of an ego. And Wilson is blending that enlightenment and romanticism sentiments. He's really promoting citizen science, and he really wants people to get out and enjoy the wonders of the United States. And without Wilson, a lot of the birds that Lewis and Clark documented might have gone undocumented longer, not giving them any credit. And honestly, it's really because of Wilson that Lewis received what little recognition he did for his scientific achievements at that time. Wilson himself is also the namesake of a few birds, like the Wilson's warbler and the Wilson's snipe. Little birds. And because of, I wouldn't say it's 100% because of him, but he is kind of one of the leaders, the pioneers of in the United States. That's getting things like illustrated bird guides with accurate information, more than just a sterile description. Even his bird descriptions of birds was lovingly done. So there's a lot of good stuff on Wilson to read. I'm going to get out of... No, I don't want any new share. I am trying to get out of share. Stop share is probably a logical button to push. So there's not a lot of solid biographies on him. This has the beginning of biography and then his letters. There's been reprints of some of his research. His illustrations, a lot of times his illustrations get mistaken for Audubon. But I think Wilson, it's interesting that he's overlooked that if we have American Audubon, we have all these things. 
And it's interesting because since I last gave my talk, there's you know, the American Ornithologist Union, they're going to rename any birds named after humans new names based on their attributes. And I get both sides. I'm not getting into a political conversation on that, but you know, the idea of what would Wilson think? I think, you know, it's hard to know. We'll never know. But we know from his own writings, Wilson was very committed to the idea of one, justice, hated slavery, and the idea of people having access to the outdoors. And while on the one hand, I think if you told him, yeah, renaming all these birds will make people feel safer, he'd probably say, eh, some of the safe, making people safer is how we treat people. But yeah, it's a hard call because the, the reasoning was the nitpicking of over whose name sticks, but then what about that person? So I get both sides of the issue, but for Wilson, some of the names that he gave you know, if you were to ask him his thoughts, you'd probably say whatever on the renaming birds. But yeah, people, everyone should get to go outside and look at a bird. So on that note, yeah, there's there's a lot. And if we were to talk about everything about Wilson and Lewis and Lewis and Clark and the birds, we could be here for We could write entire books just on those two hanging out. <laughs>